Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about the power of continued learning. And what's interesting is, you know, they approached me and asked me to do this kickoff. Um, and this is such a great community. It's really hard to kind of describe how impactful and how important this community is in continued learning and all the things that they offer. So let me just do a brief introduction. My name's George Williams, uh, founder and CEO of Reliability X. I have a master's degree in reliability engineering, CMRP, CRL, all those acronyms and fun stuff around vibration analysis and a bunch of predictive maintenance stuff. Uh, 2016 CMRP of the year, um, certified reliability, black belt, uh, all kinds of craziness going on. So yeah, like really, I'm really that amazing. Like this is just, who I am. And obviously I was born that way, right? I didn't have any learning whatsoever. So let's take a look at our community because the community is really what this is all about. So I, I really wanna just kind of dive right in here. We've got some absolute experts. I mean, just look, they've called themselves experts, right next to their names is expert, expert, expert. I, there's just some amazing folks here. Look, at you got Ricky Smith. Ricky Smith is just a legend in maintenance and reliability. This guy puts out more content than, than Mr. Beast on YouTube. The, like he just writes all day, all night. I, I gotta imagine he's got like a, like a time machine to go back and make his days longer because he is such a big contributor, it's not even funny. Guy like Joel Levitt. Joel Levitt is one of the most amazing writers in maintenance and reliability. It's just absolutely amazing. Read everything you can that this guy publishes and he publishes in some, not maybe mainstream magazines, things like Fleet Maintenance Magazine, all kinds of stuff you'll see his, his content in. And you know, if you ever go see this guy live though, he's, I can't even understand what's going on because it's like a psychedelic trip. I did figure out though exactly how to sit through and understand everything that he's saying in a presentation. You just drop a little asset right after he's introduced, you drop the needle on, on Dark Side of the Moon and then everything just makes sense. So then you got guys like Bob Latino, Bob Latino, I, like what can you say about Bob Latino? I don't know, but it ain't gonna be bad because Bob looks like the kind of guy that'll jump in his pickup truck and come up here and break my legs and I'll be doing a root cause analysis on it. Come back and say, hey, by the way, it was because I made that terrible joke. And he would come back up here, break both my arms and say, that was not a systemic issue. It's about your bad joke writing and you drinking while you write your presentations. Then you got, um, geez, we got Brian, Ryan, Dylan, and Blair. I mean, that looks like the 1993 index of baby names just vomited all over my slide deck. All right, and then we've got Radar. Radar is the humble one. Look at this, MRO expert. Radar, he, he just says, look, I, I'm an expert, but don't ask me questions about FMEA. Don't ask me questions that have nothing to do with MRO. But he still contributes. He's all over the place and writing all kinds of content on the maintenance community. Uh, and then you got me, look at me. It just says far from expert. And this is a good indication that when they were deciding who was gonna kick this off, everybody else was just busy between one and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And so I'm, I'm like the last person that they could possibly come to. So did these folks all start out as experts? Like I doubt that they all started out as experts, right? All right, so let's take a look at what we've got going on. So Arthur Ashe said that start where you are use what you have and do what you can. And that's all any of us can do. You know, we all start out differently in life and we're surrounded by folks that influence us throughout the entire journey. And some start out in great places and have lots of support and some start off, you know, maybe without a, a support mechanism to help them. It's not really about necessarily where you start. The journey in life and the journey in continued learning is about the distance you travel and not necessarily where you start. This is where I started, Thompson and Dauphin, the Fishtown section of Philadelphia, inner city, row home. These are the actual signs from in front of my house that are now hanging in my basement. Because, I mean, when you grow up in the inner city, what do you do for fun? You rip street signs down and put them in your basement and hang them up. Some of us start out poor, some of us start out with money, some of us start out with a great support system, some of us start out with, um, you know, really roadblocks and challenges in our home life. And it doesn't really matter because it's not about where you start, it's the support mechanisms that surround you that help shape and mold you as an individual. 
this is a little personal, but that's the actual house I grew up in. Then it's off to kindergarten. And at kindergarten, you finally start to see some support mechanisms, at least if you grew up like I did. And this is Miss Stark. Oh my goodness, Miss Stark, she was an absolute angel. And me, being the introvert that I am, asked her to marry me in kindergarten. I walked right up to her, big old smile, and asked her for her hand in marriage. And her reply to me was, when you're a little older. And so I had hope, I had dreams, I had capability. I'm, I got something to look forward to. So let's see how my grade school academics went. Well, here's a report card. If not for anything, my mother liked to hoard things out. And <laughs> so I have all my old report cards from grade school. And what you'll notice here is, I don't know, George is very talkative. I don't understand that as a problem. But apparently, being talkative in school was a problem. Well, let's move on. Oh, here's another one. George is a very nice little boy, but he is talkative at times. Well, George likes to talk, doesn't he? Oh, here's another one. George memorized most of a poem. Not all of it, most of it. And he needs to curb his talking. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Um, George is starting to do an awful lot of talking. Now this is like four years, three years later, still in grade school, because um, you can see my math uh, levels at like seven and eight. I only went there till fifth grade. And George now is starting to do an awful lot of talking. Here we have a teacher that doesn't look at your records, so that was really helpful. <clears throat> and this is my all-time favorite. This one says, George needs to stop his talking so others can learn. Others need to learn. Now, isn't this where teachers are supposed to recognize your skills and talents and cultivate you and motivate you? I mean, they should have been sending me to Toastmasters and Dow Carnegie classes and, and all the things necessary to learn how to speak in front of an audience and deliver content, which by the way, is exactly what I do for a living. So I had some talent. I had some hidden talent inside that through the amazement of the Philadelphia Public School District, was being completely oppressed <laughs> and suppressed and, and held back. So how do I find an outlet? What am I gonna do as a kid? I mean, how am I gonna get there? Well, I go to middle school and middle school is where you open up. Middle school is where you start to make great friends and you, you get more freedoms. You're not stuck in one class with one teacher, at least in, that's how it works in Philadelphia Public School. Now you get to wander hallways and, and talk to people in between classes. And it was really just an amazing experience. It was where I got my first taste of shop class and STEM and all that fun stuff. By the way, this is Mr. Tompkins. He's the soccer teacher. And when you're an outgoing extrovert like me, and you like to build relationships and talk, building relationships is important. In seventh grade, Mr. Tompkins and his wife had a baby girl. And so I jumped on the L and took a six pack of beer wrapped in a pink ribbon to Mr. Tompkins to congratulate him. That's right, seventh grade, 12 years old. My eighth grade yearbook says, George, thanks for the six, <laughs> Mr. T. <laughs> Whoa, what do we got here? Oh, oh we're back to Miss Stark. Well, what do you know? In middle school, Miss Stark got transferred and she became my eighth grade teacher. <laughs> so you know exactly what I did, right? I walked right up to Mrs. Stark. She was my homeroom teacher for eighth grade. And I said, well, I'm a little older. And that's when it hit me. That's when I got a big dose of reality. Now my wife saw this sign in a store she wanted to buy. And it says dream until your dreams come true. Miss Stark told me that was BS. That sign should say work until your dreams come true. You've got to put effort in. You've got to surround yourself with success. You've got to look and, and hunt down areas of opportunity. And so I was motivated now. I just realized I can't just be a dreamer. Dreamer isn't working. 
So we've got to do something more. And I found it in middle school. Throughout middle school, I was ripping things apart and trying to put them back together. Man, I was so into making sure that I was just tearing stuff apart and mostly, mostly putting all the pieces back together. And so I knew I needed to find a way to get into some type of STEM program. Now we didn't necessarily call it that then, but I needed to find a high school that could help me thrive in an area I enjoyed. And the only place to do that in Philadelphia is Jules E. Massbaum Area Vocational Technical School, or as we alumni call it, the bomb. Looks more like a prison, sitting right in the middle of the Kensington section of Philadelphia. Look at that cage on the roof. After lunch, you'd go up on the roof and play soccer or basketball underneath of that cage. We didn't even have a home field. There was no sports fields. We had to take a bus somewhere to play, to, to practice soccer or have our games. There was no home field for this school. But what it did have was shop class. And that's where I started to get molded into my engineering background and the things I loved. And there were some really amazing people at this school and really talented teachers. This is my uh, high school re, uh, picture for the Vocational Industrial Clubs of America. These were the brightest students in that school that would um, compete against area schools in their shop class activities and skills. Really amazing group of people. We've got Mrs. Ross in the upper left hand corner here. She was an English teacher and I hate English. English was just droning for me. I couldn't take it, right? I mean, a math guy, an engineering person. I wanted everything except English class. And Miss Ross, Mrs. Ross taught me that I had to be able to communicate. And I, was, I had to learn to write. And while writing is still not something I enjoy doing today. She taught me it was valuable and I make a living communicating with people. So what she taught me is just an invaluable lesson. Sometimes lessons you learn don't happen right away. You don't realize they're a lesson until later in life. Miss Fletcher in the upper right hand corner here, she was my algebra teacher. And anyone who's at algebra knows that inevitably somebody says, hey, what do I need algebra for? And Miss Fletcher gave me the most amazing piece of wisdom that I've carried with me my entire life. She said, you need algebra to pass my class and graduate. She gave me a dose of direct communication and a direct, just absolute understanding that sometimes you have to do things because they have to be done. And I didn't realize just how wonderful this wisdom was until later in life. And you've got, I mean, this is like, you know, no offense, I'm inner city. L look at this picture. You look at this and you're like, oh my goodness, it looks like, you know, it, it, these people aren't going to be successful. Most of the people I grew up with, a lot of them, no offense, they're dead on drugs or in prison. This school, not so much. This school had good educators. Even though we were all inner city kids, you got a guy like Kevin Benton. This is, this is Kevin in the, right next to his picture. Nice tall gentleman in the back. That's his IMDB account because he's an actor. You got Leslie Acosta. She's just lower and to the right of her photograph. U.S. House of Representatives. There are some amazingly talented people that come out of inner city schools. And it really is because of the community around them and the teachers that help cultivate those skill sets. And while my skill sets may have been misunderstood in grade school, they were allowed to flourish in high school. It takes a little bit more than just some skills and talents. You have to have a mentor. And most likely throughout your career, you'll have more than one mentor. This is John Williams, this is my father. Throughout high school, I worked at his place of business. He was a truck driver. And he taught me how, you know, he was a truck driver slash mechanic. 
and he taught me how to weld. He taught me how to strip an engine down and hone cylinders and and lap valve um, heads and, and all kinds of stuff. Just absolutely amazing. He, he gave me work ethic. He gave me true understanding. This guy was listening to valve taps with a stethoscope before I even knew what a predictive maintenance technology was. He taught me amazing things. Like if you're not sure if it's oil or transmission fluid leaking on the ground, just give it a taste. Transmission fluid's a little sweeter. Unfortunately, he didn't really tell me not to taste the green liquid, which explains a whole lot about my mental capacity. So now high school's done. And I am just, this is it, man. This is like, I, I'm ready for college. I'm going to be an engineer. Man, thank God I did not finish college and go become an engineer. Oh, anyway, I'm going on a straight path. I've got this now down. This is me. Like, like I literally have all of my goals mapped out. I'm not the kid that doesn't know what they want to do. I'm the kid that's got everything mapped out and that's it. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I was going to create it. I laid down the track, man. I was going to Drexel University for electrical engineering and I don't care what you did. Nothing was going to take me off the track. Oh, we're back to that picture again. Oh, look at Miss Stark. She's so cute. And look at that little girl right next to her. So while my hopes and dreams didn't land me Miss Stark, it landed me the person in the photo with her. That's my wife, Billy. We grew up right across the street from one another. Had the same kindergarten teacher. That's just an amazing love story. We're still married today. And then boom, there goes the train. We have two beautiful girls and we need to work. <laughs> we had them young and college wasn't important anymore. And so it was the school of hard knocks for me. It was work your butt off cause you gotta put food on the table. This was a big dose of reality. My dreams, at least what I thought were my dreams at the time, came crashing down. I was completely disoriented. I had no direction. I didn't understand that life is a long journey. And you learn and you struggle and you get better and you get stronger because of it. And so I had to go get money. And so I went to work at the Philadelphia Macaroni Company. And this is a place in Norristown, PA, and obviously they make pasta. And I was an operator. I was packing boxes for a living. Here I am, graduated 10th of my class, graduated National Honor Society, made it into Drexel University, and I'm packing boxes. So don't judge anybody in the position they're in. You can learn from them. They have knowledge, experience, one day I come into work and I go up to my line and my line's acting all funky. It's letting the boxes pass the filler and then it's getting pinched by, by the cylinder. And so the, they're not filling, they're dumping half on, in the box and half on the floor. And the owner's son is up there messing around trying to figure it out. So I come up behind him and ask him if I could take a look at the ladder logic. And he told me to get back to my line. I didn't know anything about ladder logic. I took second place honors in that vocational industrial clubs of America competition across the entire city and surrounding suburbs. So I let him fiddle for a little while and then I went back around and asked him again. And that happened like three times. And he finally said, you know so much, you fix it. And so I went through the ladder logic found the timing associated with the pistons and started adjusting those timings until they worked right. At that point, somebody in a leadership role has two options. They can praise you and thank you and, and look to help you move up in the company because they recognize talent where their ego can get in the way. This gentleman happened to be an ego person. <laughs> 
And so I couldn't stay there no more. I didn't make a friend. So I went to the Philadelphia Cricket Club. 1854, founding member of the U.S. Tennis Association, founding member of the U.S. Golf Association. This place in 1990 was $25,000 a year just to be a member. Really old building. You had to learn how to run, you know, conduit through solid stone and all kinds of really interesting things. You weren't allowed to rip wood down. You had to reshape it with plaster or bondo because you weren't allowed to replace anything. We still struggled at this time. So I was working here and I was cutting the ice over at the Wishicken Skating Club where Mike Richter grew up. And then boom, we have our son, Evan. Evan's born with a chromosome disorder known as 22Q deletion. He spends the first four months of his life in and out of neonatal intensive care. Wasn't even diagnosed until he was four months old. I would come home from work, go to CHOP, let my wife go home. I would sleep at CHOP till the morning. She would drop the girls off at school, come to the, to the hospital, and then I would go to work for four months. Man, this kid taught me that happiness can be found anywhere. He did nothing but smile. Still does. So we were struggling. We were beat down and we needed some opportunity. And I saw a ad in a paper to be a maintenance technician at a pharmaceutical company. And I said to my wife, I'm gonna go on that interview. And I took a day off and I went up to that interview and the interview was for an outsourced service provider named Fluidics. And I'm sitting there with Jim and Jim's reviewing my resume and Jim says, well, I'd love to hire you, but I don't have a position open. And I said, Jim, I took a day off of work. You know what that means to me? What do you mean you don't have a position open? And Jim gets on the phone and he calls the carpentry shop. He says, hey, Brian, you still looking for a painter? And Brian says, yeah, I need a painter. And Jim looks at me, says, you want to paint? I hate painting. I absolutely hate painting. And I said, yeah, of course I want to paint. Bristol Myers Squibb is a Fortune 100 company. I'll take the job. And I took a job as a painter at night. And I took a $1 an hour pay cut when we were already struggling. I was losing money going here. But I knew that a company that size would have a much bigger opportunity than me working at the Philadelphia Cricket Club. And so I was a mechanic for a little while, became a planner, went from planning. We had great success at planning. And so they decided, they said, George, what do you know about reliability? And I said, nothing. And they started sending me to school. They were sending me everywhere. Infrared, vibration, ultrasound, Dow Carnegie classes, all kinds of stuff. This is just a fraction of the filing cabinet full of these that I have. They invest it. So I found my purpose. Man, I'm going. I'm the reliability specialist at BMS and their Hopewell facility. Man, highfalutin. <laughs> and then they sat me down. They said, George, that ain't enough, man. You need a degree. It's not enough for you to just be where you're at. We can't keep promoting you. You need to go work, go get a degree. And so there I was, family and working on my degree. And it took a long time and a lot of effort. But in 2014, I earned that degree. And I got my master's degree in maintenance and reliability engineering from Monash University. It was one of the proudest moments of my life. My train was back on its tracks, only it was better because I learned and struggled and got stronger. If I had done four years at Drexel, five years, I guess, at Drexel University, came out with an electrical engineering degree, I'd probably be at some draft, well, drafting tables don't exist no more, but I'd be working in some CAD program, drawing integrated circuits somewhere. 
that's not me. This all happened for a reason. And so that's it. I got my degree. I mean, I'm Mr. Know-it-all. If you're not sure if I'm Mr. Know-it-all, go ask my wife. She'll tell you. Yeah, he's Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> At least he thinks he is. <laughs> so where do we go from there? Oh, oh, you mean I had to be nice at work too? <laughs> I mean, I'm an inner city, rough around the edges guy. I, would, I was notorious for writing scathing emails to put people in their place and tell them how I knew more than what they did. I was not a people person. And so I would get the annual sit down that said, hey, George, you got to work on your soft skills. And I had one of my bosses say, George, what is your goal when you write those emails? And I said, I don't know. What are you talking about? I'm trying to put him in his place and show him how right I am. <laughs> and he said, but is that your goal? I mean, is your goal to just piss some, you know, upset somebody and not get what you want? If you're looking for collaboration, if you're looking for exponential success surrounding you, then you have to understand your goal. You've got to get people on board and collaborate with people. So I had a post-it note on my computer screen for years. It finished out probably the last, uh, I'm going to guess, eight years of my career at BMS and the three years I was at B. Braun. There was a post-it note on my monitor that said, what is your goal? And I would make sure to write all of my emails in such a way that I got what I wanted from the other person, or at least try to, attempt to, and to collaborate and exponentially create success around me. One of the best pieces of advice I ever had. So what I need you to understand is that you never stop learning. And it's not just because you take a class. Some of it is direct and intentional. But you don't stop learning because life never stops teaching. There are scenarios in your life today that will teach you a lesson, whether it is an immediate lesson or whether it is a lesson that you learn and understand 10 years later. But they're all opportunities. Opportunities to grow, opportunities to succeed, opportunities to just expand your knowledge. And we want to take those opportunities. As I reflect on my personal and professional growth, I realize that it took a community to shape who I am today. And we only looked briefly at my professional career. We looked mostly at stuff like grade school. Imagine all the learnings that happened since then and that I've, I'm looking forward to learning tomorrow and the other tomorrows. It takes a community for us to learn. We're talking about Miss Stark, Mr. Cowley, Miss Fletcher, Mrs. Ross, Mr. Coviello, John Williams, Maureen Gribble, Maureen Getzig, Mark Galley, Blair Frazier, Paul Crocker, Durga Toddy, Mike McVicker, George Weitengruber, Uday Hardikar, Pete DiRocco, Henri Selma, Pierre Arnaud, Eric Newhard, Michele Acerno, Vincenzo Servazio, Luis Laraquante, Luis Cotto, Waldemar Rivara, Ricky Smith, Joel Levitt, Joe Anderson, Ron Moore, Max Smith, Suzanne Greenman, John Mowbray, Steve Turner, Doc Palmer, Ramesh Gulati, James Reyes Picknell, Keith Mobley, John Fortin, Dave Barloni, Cliff Williams, Klaus Block, Rajiv Anand, Jason Ballantyne, Joel Leonard, Howard Penrose, Adrian Messer, Sonia Mathura. Without all of those folks and so many more, I'd have just been that kid with that electrical engineering degree standing in the street. You may be standing where you're standing today and you are here. But it is not the end of your journey. Each and every day you get to choose different paths. Each and every day you get to either learn lessons or ignore them. 
each and every day you can engage people and understand their experiences and how they gain the knowledge they have or you can walk right past them. All it takes is hello to open up a door. So you may be standing here today, but you have an amazing opportunity over the next three days to collaborate, to, to learn, to gain knowledge, to ask questions. And I encourage you to take advantage of that. What you have to remember is that this community is here for you. It, its sole existence and purpose is to bring each other up. So take an opportunity, continue to stay engaged in the maintenance community, and just remember we are here for you. I hope you enjoy the next three days. I hope you attend as many sessions as you possibly can. And I, I hope that next year, you're one of the people that are presenting. So welcome to this year's community fair.